Every day, more than 100 Americans are killed by guns, and more than 200 are shot and wounded. Our gun homicide rate is 26 times that of other high-income nations. And yet, somehow, regulation of guns is one of our most politically divisive issues. I do a lot of traveling for research around the world pre-COVID. I go to other countries and I ask them what they want to know about America. And oftentimes the first question is, how does this happen with these gun, gun violence? What, what's so different about America? Why do you put up with it? It's, it's a mystery to others, but it's something that we, we keep doing. Today's speaker will help us think about how rhetoric plays a role in that divisiveness, how it fosters and justifies the inertia that enables so much killing. His scholarly work has tried to break down some of the most powerful rhetoric used in the gun violence debate, including the dominant narrative of protection. Craig Rood teaches rhetoric at Iowa State University, where he is associate professor of English and coordinator in the program on speech communication. His scholarship, as I mentioned, focuses on how people communicate about divisive public issues, including gun violence and mental illness, and how they might do so more productively. He's author of the 2019 book titled After Gun Violence, Deliberation and Memory in the, in a, the Age of Political Gridlock, which explores how public memory is used as a tool to persuade both sides on the debate. He's also published a number of pro, uh, journal articles with titles like Our Tears Are Not Enough, The Warrant of the Dead and the Rhetoric of Gun Control, and Identity and Partisan Reception in the U.S. Debates About Gun Violence. His writings address themes of race, identity, and masculinity, and protection in the gun debate. He's also written on rhetoric, rhetorical education, and civic discourse more generally, and we're pleased to uh, welcome him here today. We're pleased he traveled all the way from Iowa to be with us, so please join me in welcoming Craig Rood. And I didn't show off his book. <laughs> I brought the book to show off. Thank you for the kind introduction, Tom, and thank you for the invitation to come here. Um, thank you to the McFarland Center for supporting this lecture series, and thank you all for being here this afternoon. Um, as the title of my talk suggests, the topics that I speak about are relatively bleak, so I completely understand if you decide to step out at some point or decide, you know what, I'm just going to go home early today. Uh, my talk will talk about domestic violence, um, suicide, and some racism as well. So I'm a scholar of rhetoric, and hopefully you know what that means, but you might not. In general, rhetorical scholars are interested in communication. We study a variety of things, memorials and spaces such as this one, for instance, but I am fundamentally interested in language. One of my favorite descriptions of rhetoric comes from Krista Radcliffe, who says that Rhetoric is the study of how we use language and how language uses us. Her description highlights that we have agency to some extent, but to some extent, our stories and language can do our thinking for us. When it comes to the topic of gun violence, then, I focus on what and how individuals and communities and institutions communicate, as well as what that communication reveals about our fears and hopes, our sense of who we are and who we might become, Communication, argument, and public deliberation, all these things, they matter for public policy, but my work is different than what you might hear from a policy expert. Let me also say that this lecture draws together some of my previous work, including my book, um, After Gun Violence, that Tom mentioned. Um, it also draws from an essay, Forthcoming in Rhetoric and Public Affairs on Guns and Suicide, and another essay on domestic violence, under review, hopefully published soon. So, let me formally begin. 2015, President Obama, the White House. He began, there's been another mass shooting in America. This direct and frustrated opening was warranted, warranted, he later explained, because mass shootings had, in his words, become routine. Moreover, the reporting is routine. My response here at this podium ends up being routine the conversation and the aftermath of it, we've become numb to this. His assessment felt accurate to me when I heard those words in 2015, and they feel even more accurate today in 2022. But the problem goes much deeper. 
After all, this mass shooting that he was responded to, responding to um, at a community college in Oregon, that briefly captured national attention and elicited calls for change. Most do not. America collectively attends only to some mass shootings. To borrow Judith Butler's language, America has a hierarchy of grief that renders some lives more valuable than others and some deaths more grievable than others. We can explain this by pointing to a variety of identity factors, including the age, um, race, class, sexuality, and so on. With mass shootings in particular, the age and locations of victims matters a great deal. Where the young are presumed more innocent and grievable than the old, were those who were slaughtered in a school presumed more innocent and grievable than those who were slaughtered in a nightclub. But there is another layer. Despite how common mass shootings are, they comprise a relatively small portion of gun violence overall. Too often, these far more common forms of gun violence go unnoticed. We also have a distorted understanding of who commits gun violence. America's dominant narrative of protection warns against stranger danger. This narrative ignores in at least 40% of gun homicides, the victims and offender knew one another. This narrative also ignores gun suicides, which account for well over half of all gun-related deaths each year. Now, sorting out what to fear, or at least how much to fear something, it matters. In his book, The Culture of Fear, sociologist Barry Glasner warns against fearing the wrong things. Among his examples, he notes that we fret over the kidnapping of a single toddler while millions of children live in poverty and attend crumbling schools. More broadly, atypical tragedies grab our attention while widespread problems go unaddressed. His critique anticipates what scholars today describe as our attention economy and our affective economy. That's affect with an A. In short, we cannot pay attention to everything, nor can we feel connected to everything. So we need to make choices about which things to attend to and which not, which things to feel emotionally connected to and not. So for instance, while an average of 65 people die by gun suicide every day in the United States, that story seems harder to tell, sell, and understand than if 65 people died in a mass shooting. In part, that's because mass shootings are focusing events, and it is typically easier to interpret these seemingly random deaths as innocent and as violence as a public problem rather than simply a private one. While the imbalances of attention and affect are understandable, they can also be counterproductive. As Glasner explains, exaggerated or illusory threats lead us to fritter away our money and attention while keeping us from focusing on our, quote, real needs, which constantly grow larger. Now, to an extent, I agree with what Glasner is saying here. I think that we should be guided by empirical data, and we should try to make as uh, thoughtful decisions as possible. But I also want to challenge this sort of distinction between real and fake a bit. And I think one way to do so is through the concept of imagination. I disagree in part because humans are complex. We do not make decisions solely based on numbers. What counts as a real threat is not readily apparent, but instead depends on perspective and disputation. Even when the data are clear, X is empirically more common than Y. Numbers alone do not count do not account for how fears are est established, sustained, or changed. After all, fear is perceived, which means that it is perceived by someone. To ask only whether a fear is accurate or not is to miss something important. Even if a perceived danger is actually rare, it might nonetheless feel real and urgent to the person experiencing it. That fear matters to them, and it can be made to matter for others who are in community with them. To some extent, what and how we fear is within our control, but control is also beyond us. Other individuals, groups, and organizations attempt to make us fear some things rather than others and to take some actions rather than others to address those fears. In these situations, accuracy may very well be less important than the promise of attention, identity, money, power, and more. Ultimately, I want to explore this afternoon, how gun violence gets imagined, by whom, and to what effect. Um, but before I get there, I should emphasize the more basic point, which is that gun violence gets imagined. 
And now I'm using the word imagined more broadly than it is typically used. I do not mean that imagined fears are um, fake or wrong. Instead, I mean that fears could be fake, they could be real, they could be a bit of both, or it could be someplace in between. In other words, distinguishing fake and real can be complicated, and I think that the concept of imagination is crucial to make space for the complexity both of fear and the complexity of perception. As it says up here, I use imagination to describe the what-if, perhaps, and maybe capacities of language, thought, and feeling. And although there might be a forward-looking tendency to imagination, such as what might happen, what might you do after this lecture, it can also concern the past and the present. For instance, we hear Sandy Hook, or Parkland, or Trayvon Martin, or Breonna Taylor. Think back in time, and then imagine how things might have gone differently. Even if we, are thinking, even if we think we are simply observing the threat in the moment, our imagination is at work, shifting among observation, explanation, reflection, and anticipation. A person stands up in the middle of a movie theater, and we wonder whether our lives are about to be overturned or if that person just needs to go to the bathroom. That's imagination at work. I do not want to use uh, too much time reviewing previous work on imagination, but I at least need to acknowledge that there is a lot of work uh, inside and outside of rhetorical scholar rhetorical studies, ranging from scholars of classical studies to post-colonialists, feminists and queer theorists, psychoanalysts trying to account for imaginings of individuals, and social and political theorists describing national imaginaries. Rhetorical scholars, as I said, I am one of them, have long been interested um, in the relationship between language and imagination, and they've long recognized that those things shape one another. Deborah Hahi highlights that words facilitate vision, she explains how words can facilitate or can lift an audience out of the present by flooding their eyes with active images of past or projected into the future. Similarly, Michelle Kennerly explains that, quote, rhetoric's work often consists of giving presence to the unseeable, something not yet or never capable of being seen, or to the unseen, something visible but ignored. Now that might seem abstract, so let me give you an example um, called from a story on domestic violence. This is from a writer who simply identifies herself as Bonnie. As it says up here, my father was a domestic abuser whose violence and threat had gotten so bad that my family and I had to escape in the middle of the night. Leaving him did not end his threats though. He threatened to kill himself as a way to manipulate us to come back. He continued to threaten my family and anyone he thought was keeping us away from him. So Bonnie recounts what happened to her. And in so doing, I think that she's asking readers to imagine it. A lot of details are left out in this brief excerpt. We don't know Bonnie's age, what her father looked like, or when and where this violence happened. As an audience, we are left to fill in those details. Still, Bonnie uses words to help us imagine her experience of abuse, of fleeing, and of being threatened. She illustrates what Michelle Kennerly describes as rhetorical transport. In short, using words to move us. Even if audiences have not nor never will directly experience anything quite like what Bonnie describes, and even if her audience encounter her comments in a relatively safe space, her words nonetheless attempt to metaphorically place her audience in the moments she describes, both to see and feel these possibilities. If you remember nothing else a week from now, when you're enjoying your fall break, um, uh, remember the word imagination. Also, remember the word protection. Protection is arguably the most important term for both opponents and advocates of gun reform. For example, in polls of gun owners, they regularly list protection as the top reason that they own guns. We can also look to advocates' own rhetoric to see protection at work. At the National Rifle Association's 2018 convention, President Trump declared, nothing is more important than protecting innocent lives. On the flip side, consider the Brady Campaign, one of the foremost advocacy groups um, for gun reform. They describe their members as Fed up and fired up, people who are committed to protect our country from what is killing it. So 
they both seem to have a shared agreement in the value of protection. Ultimately, they disagree about how best to secure protection, and ultimately they think that the opposition, or they suggest that the opposition is not interested in protection. We care about protection, those people do not. Okay, so we're thinking about protection. Talk of protection uh, fundamentally depends on imagination. So I'm trying to connect these two concepts together. Protection, sure, but protection for whom? Protection from whom? Who is and is not part of our imagined community? Protection by what means? Who is and is not imagined as the protector or as the protected? The answers depend, of course, on who is doing the imagining. So, I told you to remember imagination and protection. The third term that I'll have you remember is stories or narrative. When I was writing this talk, I thought I was using them interchangeably, but I think by stories I mean um, concrete sort of sharing of experiences, and narratives are the more general sort of recurring patterns that happen, sort of a, a genre of storytelling. And I recognize that there can be thick uh, theoretical debate if there are literary scholars or sociologists in the room, but for our purposes, story and narrative, roughly equivalent. Narrative, generally more general of a term. So stories. Scholars inside and outside of rhetorical studies have long recognized that the stories people tell matter. Stories shape how we see ourselves and each other, as well as what we believe and how we act. Rhetorical scholar William Lewis argues that even if stories are recognized as fiction, fantasy, or false, they might still make a claim to truth, truth given the order that they impose on a chaotic world. The dominant narrative of protection in the United States suggests that we are in danger from them, the outsiders. These outsiders can be literal, those entering from outside our home, community, or country, and or metaphoric, individuals or groups who are different from us, and us in scare quotes, in terms of their appearance, identity, beliefs, and so on. You might ask, but who is a we and who is not? Who is a them or an outsider? Again, these answers depend on who is speaking or imagining. I would say that this dominant narrative has bipartisan appeal and is bolstered by seemingly innocuous sources, such as like local TV news coverage. But gun advocates in particular have mastered this story and rarely do they veer from it. Moreover, they take it a step further and insist that guns are the best and perhaps only means of protecting ourselves against these outsiders. Here, for instance, is President Trump at the NRA's 2018 convention. He says, Democrats and liberals in Congress want to disarm law-abiding Americans at the same time they're releasing dangerous criminal aliens and savage gang members onto our streets. In Trump's telling, the threat is double. One threat comes from Democrats who want to disarm us, leaving us vulnerable and defenseless. The second threat comes from people that Trump describes as, quote, criminal aliens and, quote, savage gang members. As if those labels were not enough to indicate their status as outsiders, Trump indicates that they are coming onto our streets, implying that they don't live here. They're outsiders. They're not their streets. They are not us, nor are they part of us. Consider just one additional example to illustrate this dominant narrative. Um, this is a 2012 response to the mass shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary um, School. Rather than downplay risk of future violence, the NRA's leader amplified the risks. To quote directly from Wayne LaPierre, quote, when you hear the glass breaking in your living room at 3 a.m. and call 911, you won't be able to pray hard enough for a gun in the hands of a good guy to get there fast enough to protect you. Now, again, he's using imagination to place us in a moment. And he's imagining glass breaking at 3 a.m. Presumably, it's a glass breaking of somebody trying to break into our home. He's not talking about a domestic dispute, for instance, of somebody throwing a glass. Now, at this point in my talk, I need to be clear. Um, I need to be clear the whole time, but especially right now. I do not deny that sometimes protection is needed from them, nor do I deny that gu a gun can sometimes be useful as a means of protection for some people in some situations. My point is that this narrative is not the whole story, nor is it the only story. 
The main problem that I see with the dominant narrative is its relative prominence and power, with its dominance working to distort how we collectively imagine danger and protection. But here are three additional types of problems with this narrative, especially as it is expressed by gun rights advocates. First, there are empirical problems. Empirical research challenges a story's assumption that danger comes predominantly from outsiders and that guns are the best means of protection against these outsiders. According to the Harvard Injury Control Research Center, self-defense gun use is rare and not more effective at preventing injury than other protective actions. Second, there are conceptual problems. Distinctions between us and them, insider and outsider, are far more complicated than this dominant narrative suggests. For instance, such distinctions regularly traffic in classist, racist, and sexist assumptions about who belongs and who does not, who is dangerous and who is not, who is worthy of protection and who is not. Third, and this is sort of going to be my focus for the rest of the talk, there are problems related to attention. In focusing our attention on danger from them, what about the dangers from us and from those who are neither in us nor them? Communication scholars, feminist historiographers, and critical race theorists have long recognized that trying to challenge or critique a dominant narrative often doesn't work very well just by pointing to alternative um, evidence. Instead, you have to offer an alternative story that challenges those preconceptions and offers a different view of the world. As Christina Cedillo and Phil Brad explain, stories and counter stories can serve as a way of speaking truth to power providing alternative accounts from marginalized perspectives. In this next part, I want to show how stories about gun suicide and domestic violence serve as a counter-narrative that both critiques the dominant narrative of protection and helps us reimagine gun violence. The stories I analyze are from Every Town for Gun Safety's website called Moments That Survive. The stories are written by presumably everyday people. They're not experts, famous, or paid spokespeople, as far as I can tell. The site asked potential contributors, how has gun violence changed your life? Add your story. The site does not automatically arrange the stories by the form of gun violence. Instead, the default mode um, is to present all different forms of gun violence. So it might seem somewhat random. You have a story about domestic violence next to a story about suicide, next to a story about police violence, next to a story about an accident. But I think that sort of arrangement is deliberately part of their mission to suggest that these are all part of the larger problem of gun violence. And these are all humans that we should care about. Um, but I was able to isolate the stories focused on domestic violence and suicide by using the site's search function, and I found dozens of results. And within each of these stories, there's a balance between sort of the personal and the general. Some writers share firsthand accounts, while others describe uh, parent, child, sibling, friend, or neighbor who experienced gun violence. Writers can choose whether and how to name themselves. There is a mixture of full names, first names only, pseudonyms, and no names. And I should also say that while anyone can share a story, every town provides guidance about um, which stories will be published, even offering writing guide guidance and advice. So for example, a page on the website advises Please do not include names or images of the perpetrators in posts. Furthermore, posts that describe suicide in a positive way or encourage people to harm themselves or to make suicide seem like an accepted solution will not be accepted on this site. Some writers list dates as well as geographic locations, but such details are not built into the website's default settings. Although the stories describe particular people and particular experiences, I think they're trying to make an argument, as the title of this, the website suggests, that these are moments that survive. So it's trying to make a broader claim about the value of these lives. By hiding, or at least not foregrounding, markers such as age, class, gender, location, nationality, occupation, race, sexuality, and more, the site coaches viewers to see these as simply people. The choice is not without consequence, I need to say. If one were to judge domestic violence by these stories alone, you might not recognize that men are disproportionately the perpetrators of intimate partner violence, and that, as Leah Goodmark notes, women comprise 76% of the victims of intimate partner violence, nor would you understand the unique dangers that trans women of color face, nor would you recognize that suicide rates are disproportionately high for indigenous people, veterans, 
and white men, old and rural men. Given that the website is sponsored by Every Town for Gun Safety, it is unsurprising that many of these stories discuss the role of guns in this violence and in turn argue for gun reforms. The fact that Every Town maintains this website suggests that it, it itself views these stories as valuable for its identity and advocacy. Given such audience and purpose, then the stories are more likely to be read and circulated among people who are already interested in gun reform or looking for support from other people who have been affected by gun violence. I think, though, that these stories matter. Even if no one's mind has changed, even if only a few people happen to encounter these stories. I want to make the case that they matter by tracing how the moments that survive writers challenge the dominant narrative of protection and thus offer a counter narrative of protection or a counter story. Given my limited time, I'll focus only on how these stories attempt to reimagine two key terms first, character, and then guns. Questions of character are central to how Americans understand and talk about gun violence. Several dichotomies are typically at work. Us versus them, insiders versus outsiders, good people versus evil people. I have already noted that the dominant narrative of protection suggests that danger comes from them, outsiders, and evil people. Some of the moments that survive writers pick that side of the equation too. But overall, I see them doing something far more significant. They attempt to shift readers' attention to danger on the other side of the binaries, danger that comes from us, insiders, good people, or at least people that are complex. Some writers even push further, suggesting how the binaries themselves are inadequate for understanding human character and gun violence. So let me start with the stories about gun suicide. These stories disrupt the typical dichotomies by shifting attention from two people to one. There is no good guy and bad guy. The suicide death involves someone who is both the initiator and the receiver of harm. Moreover, the writers use personal stories to highlight particular suicides and in individuals rather than empty character tropes. Katie writes about her friend Sam Riggs as one of the most outgoing, energetic, intelligent people you'd ever met. He was a sophomore in high school, taking advanced classes, playing trumpet in band, and in line to become co-captain of the academic team with me. Not only are the dead depicted as people, they are typically depicted as good people. Nice, friendly, loving, and thoughtful. I think this is, you know, subtle, but significant. And it matters because there's often silence, shame, and stigma um, often surrounding suicide. So I see them attempting to challenge that. Several writers also go a step further by depicting the dead as complex people, thereby suggesting that the labels of good and bad are inadequate for understanding gun suicide and gun violence more broadly. One writer describes her older brother Ben as being, quote, quick to anger, but even quicker to laugh and to love, full of confusion, but also of generosity and kindness. Such depictions humanize the dead without glorifying them. The depictions um, show us complex humans, and that challenges the good people versus bad people frame perpetuated by opponents of gun reform. Moreover, these depictions challenge politicians who rely on the trope of the perfect victims of gun violence to argue for collective action. Was Ben good or bad? Perhaps both. Perhaps neither. More to the point, these writers suggest that this question does not capture the complexity of people and the ambiguity of life. Regardless of whether readers judge people like Ben as good, bad, or somewhere in between, or something different, their lives mattered and their premature deaths should concern us. By connecting gun suicides to their contributing causes, the moments that survive writers highlight how character and action are intertwined with personal and social context. So in addition to pointing to guns, the moments that survive writers point to a wide range of factors that contribute to suicide. Writers point to mental illness, especially depression. They point to alcohol. For instance, Lawrence had been drinking heavily before this. 
Others point to distress over their relationships. Lee, for instance, experienced a breakup with his girlfriend, and Susan experienced a complicated divorce and stressful custody battle. Money and status can also contribute. Ben, a father of four and husband, had just lost his home. Taken as a whole, these causal accounts further humanize the dead. They invite readers to see these dead people as people who struggle with the same sort of things that many people struggle with. Accounting for causes also invites readers to recognize how norms and policies might have impacted their decision to die by suicide. Given Ben's decision to die after losing his home, readers might wonder whether America should provide a stronger social safety net, including, including housing assistance, or how to disentangle masculinity from the conventional role of provider. These stories do not deny that people have agency and that to greater or lesser extent, they chose to end their life, but no choice happens in a vacuum. If their personal and social context were different, perhaps their choice would have been different. I spent quite a bit of time on suicide. I want to transition to thinking about character in domestic violence. Um, the cases of domestic violence offer a far more complicated picture of character. First, I should say that the violence described in these stories is horrific and inexcusable, and the writers are clear on that point. Yet they describe and ask us to imagine the perpetrators as one of us, or at least not one of them, like, at least not fully one of them, or an outsider. In these stories, as in our national statistics, the majority of abusers are uh, men. And in the stories, abusive men are labeled as husbands and fathers, friends and neighbors, which is another way of saying that these men are known. Moreover, they are not wholly or timelessly evil. At least at some point, these men were judged as being worthy of marriage, of being a parent, of befriending, or of acknowledging. Christina, for instance, describes a neighbor across the street who helped mow our lawn when my mom was busy or helped us clear branches after a hurricane. Later, it became, became clear that he was wicked. She tells us that he killed his wife and threatened Christina and her family. But he did not present himself as a murderer from the start, nor was he destined to become a murderer. People change, sometimes quickly and sometimes gradually. Jody, for instance, described a man who shot and killed my 17-year-old daughter, Olivia, shot me in the head, then killed himself with a Glock. She had been with him for 30 years, but it was not clear until the end for her, and perhaps for him, the sort of harm that he could do. When the perpetrators of gun violence are depicted as wholly of them, as unknown and unintelligible monsters, then the source of such violence can seem unalterable, and we are left with limited options. Most often, the options are either shoot him or imprison him. But humanizing the perpetrators of domestic gun violence, um, the moments that survive writers make space for readers to consider other ways to prevent or address violence. The writers highlight that abuse does not happen in a vacuum. One writer says, quote, he knew he was losing control. Another writer says he was mentally ill. Another writer says he was in an alcohol-filled rage. And another writer says he wasn't the same after returning from the war. Now, I'm in somewhat tricky territory here. And so there's a, a balance, difficult balance to be found. Um, the writers indicate that the abusers bear responsibility for their abuse. But they also, I think, want to make the case that we bear collective responsibilities as a country for preventing domestic gun violence and adequately supporting those who are subject to abuse. Similar to stories about suicide, the details from these stories, such as Jody's claim that he knew he was losing control, they urge us to consider causes and potential solutions to domestic violence, including changes in, in policies and norms regarding addiction treatment, anger management, guns, norms of masculinity, physical and mental health care, among other reforms that domestic violence researchers point to. While there are problems with, the depicting, with depicting the perpetrator of gun violence as too much of a them, there are also dangers of overcorrecting and seeing per perpetrators as too much of an us. Caring too much about abusive men, particularly abusive white men, has long protected them and harmed the women and children subject to their abuse. Page Sweet, shows, Page Sweet shows how since at least the 1970s, feminists have challenged the presumption that 
Quote, he's a good guy, an upstanding citizen. He'd never do that, or he did do that. But it's not that big of a deal, and he shouldn't be punished because dot, dot, dot. That, struggles continue, that struggle continues today. Kate Mann warns of the dangers of hympathy. Her label for the disproportionate or inappropriate sympathy extended to a male perpetrator over similarly less privileged female targets or victims in cases of sexual assault, harassment, and other misogynistic behavior. Overall, the moments that survive writers express ambivalence and thus search for a middle space between too much and too little sympathy or too little empathy. They do so by depicting and asking us to imagine the perpetrators of gun violence as neither entirely an us nor a them, an insider nor an outsider, a good person nor an evil person. Instead, the perpetrators exist between these poles, occupy different positions at different points in time, or embody both poles at once. They are an us in one respect, but a them in another respect. Contrary to the dominant narrative of protection, these abusers are not abstractions. They're not totally evil. The moments that survive stories urge us to see the abusers as people, flawed people, but people. They are not wholly disconnected from us. They are part of our communities and may be in our family or home. Such a depiction makes it harder to dismiss the perpetrators of violence and more urgent collectively to account for them and their violence. So these writers um, urge us to reimagine character of the perpetrators and victims of gun violence, but they also urge us to reimagine guns. While gun rights advocates regularly describe guns as neutral objects, objects no different than knives or ropes, researchers who study gun violence consistently demonstrate the opposite. The means by which violence is undertaken matters. As Philip Cook and Kristen Goss explain, guns do not cause violence, but they do intensify violence. The National Coalition Against Domestic Violence highlights that the presence of a gun in a domestic violence situation increases the risk of homicide by 500%. Suicide attempts with guns are far deadlier than other methods. Michael Nessis explains that of the suicide attempts with a gun, 85 to 95% result in a death, whereas only 2 to 3% of intentional drug overdoses result in death. The moments that survive writers... Um, their stories echo these findings about guns and their contribution to domestic violence and suicide. But they work slightly different than just numbers alone do. They help us see how guns and protection can be at odds rather than aligned. Sylvia explains that her son and daughter-in-law had a gun in their home for protection. They knew guns were dangerous, and they spent many hours teaching their children about gun safety that they were dangerous and should never be touched unless an adult was present. But their 10-year-old son, Machil, Sylvia's grandson, used the gun to end his life. Sylvia notes the tragic irony. By keeping a loaded gun on the top shelf of their closet, they felt they were protecting their family. Little did they know that the harm would come from within. Firearm training and safe storage can be helpful, yet as Sylvia's story highlights, these measures are no guarantee. Similarly, Pam writes of her son Todd, who purchased a gun to protect his family, his fiance, her two children, and himself. But then Todd began to struggle with personal and mental health issues. Todd was a health counselor who helped so many people during his life, she says, but ultimately he could not figure out how to help himself. Pam's story of her son recognizes that sometimes people have good reasons for having a gun, but their reasons for using it might change. She writes, if you or your loved one is struggling, the best thing to do is to find a safe place for that gun until they are no longer struggling. In some situations, at least, a gun's absence is required to protect oneself and others. And whereas the uh, gun rights advocates ask us to imagine ourselves as the good guy holding the gun against an outsider, the moments that survive writers urge us to imagine what it is like to be on the other side of the gun, to be threatened, terrorized, harmed, or killed by a guy with a gun, including guys who see themselves as the good guys and as protectors. I want to quote one of the moments that survives um, writers at length to illuminate these dynamics. She describes herself as a survivor for more than 30 years now. 
She doesn't list a name, so it's just the anonymous writer. She writes that my husband was abusive, and when I finally left him for good, he found out where I was living and showed up. I was seeing someone else, and we were going out. As I sat in the passenger seat, my husband pulled alongside and started talking. We were driving down a busy street, and when my husband did not like the response from the guy I was seeing, he shot him. The bullet struck the guy in the arm. Subsequently, my husband was convicted but only served a couple of years. After going to the hospital and talking with police, I went home. I was alone and afraid. I crawled around the townhouse on the floor, afraid my husband would come back and shoot through a window. I had to move again. She continues. When I look back on my life with my husband, he always carried a gun. We slept with a gun hanging on the bedpost. He always had to be ready for an intruder. I have no idea of the subliminal message I was getting. Domestic violence was my life during that marriage. Now, I could spend 20 minutes sort of parsing this out. First, I'll just say, oof. I mean, there's a, there's a lot here. One of the things that stands out to me is that her former husband always carried a gun, even while sleeping, because he was worried about an intruder, an outsider. He likely prided himself on being a protector and a good guy with a gun, but he nonetheless used that gun to terrorize, terrorize his wife and injure another man. The author of this story uh, was not killed, nor was she shot, yet she still was profoundly affected. Throughout their years of marriage, the presence of a gun operated as a threat, she says, a subliminal message that weighed heavily on her. She left, yet the danger continued. She describes and thus asks us to imagine being alone and afraid, as she was, crawling around the floor to avoid getting shot in case he returns, as she did, and ultimately deciding to find a new home. Big picture, the moments that survive writers ask readers to imagine their perspective, to approximate, not come close, but approximate, what it looks and feels like to be threatened with a gun. While opponents of gun reform insist that guns are the surest and perhaps only way to secure protection, the moments that survive stories suggest otherwise. Now, I see I'm at 40 minutes. I'm going to start to wrap things up. Don't put your coats on yet. It's going to take me a few minutes to wrap things up. Um, I have several things that I want to say by way of conclusion. The first is that whenever I tell people that my research focuses on gun violence, usually they tell me uh, their solution for how to fix it or ask my solution for how to fix it. And I would be lying if I said that I don't, didn't develop opinions through studying this topic. I agree with and defer to public health and policy experts who highlight that the rates of gun violence in the United States are wildly disproportionate to other high-income countries. In his introductory comments, Tom noted that it's like 26 times as, many, as much gun violence as other high-income countries. One of the key distinctions between them and us is our relatively lax gun laws. I think we need to reform our gun laws and our norms regarding gun ownership and use. But I've also learned from scholars such as Ms. Michelle Alexander, Heather McGee, James Foreman Jr., and Elizabeth Hinton, whose picture I forgot to put up here, um, that America's criminal justice system too often targets and punishes people of color and the poor. If I could wave a magic wand then, I would change our gun laws, reform our criminal justice system, and simultaneously rejuvenate systems of support, such as healthcare, housing, and economic security, the kinds of support that can reduce the likelihood for violence to occur, to help people safely leave abusive relationships, and to support those who live with the after effects of gun violence written into and onto their minds and bodies. And while I'm at it, I would say we need better versions of masculinity. Women and non-binary folks have the same ability as men to acquire and use guns, but they do not. It is not even close. None of those reforms are simple nor easy. And in our fractured America, we must also account for the many gaps between public opinion and political action, including partisanship, voting in various efforts to thwart it, and the role of money in politics and in our attention economy. Those are the solutions, at least as I understand them. I think my sources and reasoning are good, 
but I acknowledge that I'm fallible and I could be wrong. Solutions are important, and they are worth debating in earnest. My goal in this lecture, however, has been to take a step back to account for and hopefully help you better understand the problem of gun violence, specifically how our language and stories shape and misshape our understanding of gun violence. Whereas the dominant narrative of protection suggests that protection is needed from them, the literal and metaphoric outsiders, I see the moments that survive writers doing something different. They're highlighting that protection is also needed from us, literal and metaphoric insiders. As should be clear from the preceding analysis, I find their counter-narrative, the shift from them to us, to be both persuasive and urgently needed. This counter-narrative seems especially urgent for opponents of gun reform, particularly those who do not recognize the dangers that gun ownership and use can pose to themselves, to their loved ones, and to strangers. Yet, it's complicated. Protection from or for us is imperfect. Thanks to Kenneth Burke, among others, rhetorical scholars have long recognized that us and them, along with their many variants, are unstable categories and inherently exclusionary. Briefly consider George Zimmerman's 2012 murder of Trayvon Martin. In her analysis of the case, Ursula Orr points to America's per pervasive logic of black criminality and white vulnerability. She traces this back to America's founding. And this logic helped Zimmerman see Martin's black skin and hoodie in a predominantly white community, and Zimmerman immediately rendered Martin a them, an expendable them. Zimmerman and the jurors who acquitted him understood the slaying of a 17-year-old not as a murder, but as an act of protection, protection of us and for us, and us that unfortunately did not include black teenagers. In writing about gun suicide and domestic violence, the moments that survive writers that I analyze do not seem to be relying on a racially exclusionary us. Instead, their us asks readers to look at the danger that they pose to themselves and their loved ones it requires a kind of self-reflection. It also requires care for others, like or unlike oneself. The writers imply a relatively capacious us, one that works to include people who have historically been cast as literal or metaphoric outsiders. And while I commend that effort, I also want us to be cautious because even an inclusionary us must be constantly monitored for exclusions so that America does not simply continue in purchasing protection for some while scapegoating and disproportionately harming those who are already made vulnerable. At minimum, we should ask, who does us include? Who does it exclude? Why and to what effect? We might also reconfigure the pronouns and prepositions to further reimagine protection. For instance, consider protection for them. If seeing certain individuals as one of us is too much to ask, as I think it can be in the case of domestic abusers, they're not one of us, they're a them. Perhaps they can remain a them, yet still be worthy of protection and safety. What would that look like? What practices or policies might that entail? Or consider what it might mean to imagine protection for someone who's between us and them, a friend who did a bad thing, or protection beyond us and them, someone for whom those categories are inadequate. Now, I hope that the three terms that I've talked about this afternoon, imagination, protection, and narrative or story, have helped you better understand debates over gun violence. But I'm also hopeful that these terms are useful for understanding additional problems. After all, Americans speak of environmental and trade protections, as well as protecting our homes and neighborhoods. Wars are regularly launched and defended under the banner of protection, protecting America and its allies, for instance, or protecting alleged American values. People debate whether and how to protect our planet, workers, and the vulnerable. Protection is sought for concrete things, such as health, our pets, our property, and more abstract things like the border, freedom, the sanctity of marriage. We acquire and use various objects that promise to protect us, including airbags, cameras, fences, gloves, locks, passwords, sunscreen, vaccines, and more. 
Sometimes we hear that individuals and families are responsible for their own protection, while other times we hear that protection is best achieved by laws and policies, such as sexual harassment policies. That protection is best achieved through institutions, such as the criminal justice system, or that protection is best secured through authority figures or groups, God, doctors, gangs, soldiers. In short, protection saturates our words and our world. Thus, protection remains key for those of us striving to understand and improve our words and our world. As I have asked today, so we should continue to ask, who or what do we imagine we need protection from? And who do we imagine as a protector and the protected? Who is excluded? What stories do we tell? What do those stories ignore? Finally, how might we tell different stories that help us reimagine protection? Protection from gun violence, as well as protection from the many other problems that we face. Thank you. <laughs>